<clears throat> the rumor went out that Lady Astor had called us the D-Day Dodgers. Mm -hmm. And the two types cartoon a few days later had these two officers talking to each other. And one is saying to the other, which D-Day does she mean, old boy? <laughs> uh, because the people in Italy had been through several D-Days. Where the D-Day Dodgers out in Italy Always on the Vino, always on the spree Eight army scroungers and their tanks We live in Rome among the Yanks We are the D-Day Dodgers Way out in Italy We landed at Salerno A holiday with pay The Jerry's got their bands out to greet us on the way Showed us the sights They gave us tea We all sang songs The beer was free To welcome d -Day. We were mostly too young to be regular songs right. We right. were called up mm -hmm. I was yeah, I was called up when I was 18 I found myself in Aberdeen in Gordon Barracks, and that was it. Yeah. And then uh, we were trained, and uh, eventually I joined a, a uh, party that was going out there. We went out on uh, the Empress of Australia. I arrived in Naples in about, I think it was the 1st of April 1944. Yeah. No, I was Royal Navy. Uh, I was on the landing craft, and we were uh, assisting the Eighth Army along the coast carrying supplies. And when the war finished in North Africa, then they proceeded the other way. Then and mm. we took in the invasion of Sicily, Salerno, and Anzio, and so. In fact, I was never actually on the land. <laughs> I was only on the <laughs> ship, taking them, leaving them, and going <clears throat> to something else, you know. But uh, I, I was 17 when I joined the Navy, but uh, I, I wasn't called up because I didn't want to be a soldier. I lived in the country, and uh, one of my friends came home in a sailor's uniform, and I thought that would do. And then, so. That's how come I would I joined nineteen forty two and uh, and there I am now. Had you ever been abroad standing. before? Big you, probably, you probably had never been abroad before, have you? Had you? Oh crikey, no. no. So I would hope not. <laughs> Only in a playground. <laughs> yeah, because you were yeah. seven, 17 when you joined up. Seventeen when I joined. So I mean, what was the experience like well, it, suddenly Well you were young and yeah. it was an experience, it was good fun mm. to start off with. <laughs> And it got the nitty gritty, then it took that as it came. It, I don't think, it's hard to say, it, it, was, it was an experience that you'll never forget. And now you're home now at this time of life. I'm really glad you did it. That's the way I feel. And I'm grateful to be home yeah. when you see what we left behind. Because it is sad, mm. literally. I, I, it is. Very moving, and you go back there, innit? Well, I was 19 when I joined, I was a volunteer. The call up age in uh, 1940 was 20, and I was 20 in November, but in the July of 1940, I, had, I didn't want to go into a tank regiment, I wanted to go in the army, so I volunteered with the Coldstream Guards, and um, I served for seven years with the Coldstream Guards. In uh, December 1941, um, our fur battalion had been out in uh, Egypt since 1937. When the war broke out, they still had to stay there. Mm. Um, anyway, the, the, we, we sent uh, drafts out to reinforce them from our um, training or holding battalion in uh, Surrey. And um, 
but I happened to be by the notice board when the notice came up for for draft, where they had been getting 14 days embarkation leave, so I thought I'm in for this. So I went into the office with the volunteers to go, and all we got was seven days embarkation leave, so I lost out. But um, I went abroad January 42 and um, joined my battalion in the desert. And my biggest, or well, not the biggest, but the difference from going to Italy, I mean, the reason we went to Italy, we just detailed out our brigade had to go to Italy. It wasn't a question of volunteering, you just went. Mm. And I found the biggest difference was having gone from the desert, which was relatively flat, we were going to Italy where there were mountains, rivers, etc. So that was a, an acclimatisation, getting to know that. That winter of 44 was one of the coldest they'd had. Yeah. We were issued with white uniforms to go patrolling because there was so much snow yeah. about. Uh, it was ridiculous, really. For the first winter of 43, it was torrential rain and um, only track vehicles that could really move, jeeps and track vehicles, <coughs> everything else bogged down. Um, they're pretty wet and muddy. I was with um, an in an office near the city of London, in the city of London. Mm. <coughs> and in 1936, there were about eight of us youngsters learning the business. And we all volunteered to join various different territorial regiments. So in, I joined the London Scottish. Um, now, I was then posted up to the Midlands and I couldn't attend the parades. So I went to the Leicestershire Regiment to ask if I could do the parades there. Um, he said, well, you've done all this training, you want to become an officer. So I said, OK, and he said, well, you will have to leave the London Scottish. Um, so four weeks after the war was declared, I got my honourable discharge from the London Scottish. <laughs> and I had to wait uh, before I could join up any unit that uh, would accept volunteers in those days. Uh, there were only two. The ATF, who were ambassador for the army, or the guards, I joined the guards and uh, did my service there. And then it goes on from there, I was posted to the Sandy And uh, eventually I was in a reconnaissance regiment and we were in Africa and uh, we were in the Salerno invasion. And of course that was very interesting because we heard while we were on the ships going to the landing that the Italians had capitulated and all the soldiers were overjoyed thinking they were going to have a happy landing. We had to tell them it wasn't going to be that. And uh, when we did land it was horrible. <laughs> Actually, I remember we came down the coast from the north slightly. So we were going southwards towards Salerno in our convoy. And on the headlands on Italy, we could see the headlights of the Panzer Division coming to meet us. Which is rather friendly of them. <laughs> well, I was called up when I was 18. And uh, went to Gaytown for my training. I could have shot the corporal because he finished his training it's good, it's good. and he volunteered for guard on Christmas Day. <laughs> <coughs> guard duty on Christmas Day. And we went to uh, up in Fish Guard up in Wales for more training. So they called us back from Fish Guard and got ready to pack up. I think we went from Liverpool on the SS Maria, I think it was, the troop ship. Went to Algiers, down to Philipville, up there. I joined the 6th Battalion at Suez. Suez. I then went up to uh, Tripoli, 
We've done more training around there, and that's where we went to Salerno, well, went to Battipaglia from uh, Tripoli. That's where I landed it to Battipaglia there. And uh, actually, it was where they, more or less, where they uh, attacked at the Battipaglia Cemetery down, where the cemetery is straight down to the beach down there, that's more or less where we landed down there. But uh, I think as I explained to you before that that thing that always sticks in my mind Your lucky escape. Yes. Uh, That's my story. Corporal because I mean uh, Tommy Knapp, how is Corporal Knapp, according Corporal Knapp and she can back that up. He said, my name's Tommy. On parade, this is Corporal, but what? This is Tommy. And uh, we was cleaning the brain gun out. And we was at the side of the river, quickly down uh, there. And uh, he said to me, he said, go and fetch the ammunition, Charlie. This is where we fill the magazine took. That's all this is. I went and got the ammunition <laughs> and just had to drop it down. I'm not being funny or anything like that. <coughs> I said, I can't stop Tom McGregor for his shot. And I'd only gone from here to that corner, that wall from there. There's such a bang, and the shell had come down. I mean, I'd got my trousers down. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know until the call with KD was up that had been wounded, because the blood was coming down me. The poor old Tommy. I was so. It's not in prison, it's just cold. Brain good to go and need to go. Even bits, that's all stuck in mind. Sorry. Well, I have an early start in the morning. I joined the army in 1938, January. And I was a week on the 15th. I went in with apprentice. And did three years at Chepstow. And then from there I chose a regiment to go to and I chose the Royal Artillery. And uh, travelled all over England and Scotland, it was uh, both of us, you know, aircraft and things like that. Mm. And uh, worried all the time that the war we broke out a year and eight months after I joined up. And uh, was frightened to death the war was going to be over before I get into it as a regular soldier. <laughs> And eventually, uh, get posted to Woolwich, and there were about 50 odd people all milling around in a pile, and nobody taking any notice. Two officers arrived, and one said, uh, NCOs, pull this lot in. And there was an NCO among the lot of us. So they said, uh, No NCOs, any regular soldiers. And there were two of us, who were myself and Scotsman. And within 10 minutes, we were made up to Bombardier. And we were in charge of a draft. And eventually we sailed from Gurick in Scotland. And uh, after a long winded journey, uh, first stop was at uh, West India in West Africa. Just a stop there, just couldn't get off. From there on to Durban. And uh, came ashore at Durban. And there's a point there, anybody that comes through Durban during the war, well, there's a lady in white. Whether you've heard of her or not, I don't know. But there was quite a big article on her. She met every convoy in and out during the war and sang through a megaphone. Wonderful lady. Anyway, so we went to shore that night and they said, you'll be here for a week because the troop ship has taken Italian prisoners of war back to Cape Town to put them in the bag. And the, uh, the troop ship was the West um, Empress of Canada, Canadian Pacific Liner. And uh, we should have gone back a week later and got aboard. We were there for a week and nothing happened. And after six weeks, we were still there. And we were billeted on Clarewood Racecourse at Durban. And uh, we only learned after, after the war, really, in early rumours, but my son has checked out on computers since, that to 12 hours after leaving Durban, 
with the Italian British of War mainly on, on board, an Italian submarine got her with two torpedoes and she sunk in 12 hours. As I say, my son found out quite a bit of that on his uh, computers. Mm. So then we had to wait then, of course, after six weeks, and then we got aboard a dirty little tramp steamer called the City of London. And uh, four hours out of Durban, she broke down, and of course, with a convoy, they wouldn't stop. You're just on your own if you broke down. And uh, even escort, they weren't allowed to stop and pick anybody up. But in, quite honestly, it never ever occurred to me that there was any danger. Never thought about torpedoes or anything else. And uh, four times we broke down before between Durban and Bombay. And at Bombay, they took her into dry dock because she'd been breaking down all this time. We were sent up to Dulali, which is quite a reputation in the army. And you think it's mad because known as Dulali, you know. And we had another six weeks there. And then back down again. But we've always wondered if the first troop ship hadn't been sunk, where we would have finished up because the North African desert was going at that time. And uh, anyway, from there, from uh, Bombay, we back again and uh, up the Persian Gulf and finished up in Iraq. <laughs> and so we're 39, I was quite happy. Yeah, weren't we? We're in 1940 <laughs> came when the trouble started. Mm. So I was called up just before I was 22 years old. And I had training at Bulford, passed out. One night, everyone in the camp, everyone had finished the training, called onto the square and said to Dunkirk, I was in the RASC, and we understood it was to salvage vehicles prior to the evacuation. India, I was in Dulali. <laughs> you were in Dulali, were you? Travelled across India <laughs> and back again. We were the reserve division, the 5th Division. The reserve didn't go anywhere. We weren't, we weren't needed because the Japanese had been stopped. We came back to Bombay, up to the Persian Gulf, through Basra. to Basra, through Iraq of the Paitak Passage to Iran, near Coombe. And we were told there that the army was going on the offensive rather than being defensive. We came back down through Baghdad, through Jordan, into Syria, Damascus, where we yeah. trained for uh, whatever was happening, you see. And eventually we waterproofed our vehicles, put them on board ship, and trained and went to the other side of Cairo. Talk to him. All the division of the driver went to the side of Cairo and waited to be called to the ships. We went back to the ships and we set off on a secret journey, which we thought might be Greece. So we got one day out and got the book Soldier's Guide to it, Sicily. And a few days later, after a rough passage, we arrived in Sicily. We dropped off the cargo ships of the landing craft. My landing craft was bombed. I was made to drive off 200 yards from the shore and I'm sunk into another bomb hole and tried to get out, and after that I don't remember anything for about two hours. I don't know how I got to the beach or anything. Eventually I must have come round, I must have reacted normally. Went down to see the beach master, see when they were going to drag my vehicle out to the water. He said, we're leaving it one morning. And uh, it took me 48 hours to get it going. And then we carried on to Sicily. Then we were on the, if, the day we invaded Italy, I was there, D plus half an hour, and we carried on eventually, but up to date, I think with Potenza. Then we cut across country and went up the east coast. And 
and after that we came to join the 5th American Army to cross the Garigliano River. We crossed the Garigliano River, then we were sent to Anzio. From Anzio there was a breakout, of course, and in the fall of Rome we came out of action. And we were sent back down to, I think, it, Barrio, Toronto. And we, had, we thought we were coming home, but no, we went back to the Middle East. And we were sent to um, Palestine, Egypt and Palestine. And we were there for rest and retraining, etc. Came back through Italy to Port Texas, an American base, up to Marseille, up through France to Belgium, where I got three, uh, I'll uh, believe, for, after three years. And so my daughter's third birthday, who was born two days before I left to go abroad, we went to see. And uh, I was in uh, Germany to the end of the war. I think the most scariest thing was, apart from that, I would have hated to have been an infantryman for a kickoff, especially at Anzio. And in the middle of the night, we'd take in ammunition and water to the front line. We were, I was divided to the quarters, we were employed for other things carrying ammunition and water, afraid of making any noise whatsoever, because all the land was covered by German machine guns, and you could hear the between two men saying, hush, let, let it quiet. You know, you had to be careful. They opened fire on you, we had time to get into a bomb hole if necessary, but I mean, that was the most scariest part of the campaign in Italy for me. It was an army carrying out, as I say, I wouldn't like to be an infantryman. But, uh, it was bad enough during the middle of the night. Um, I was at a place called Giovanna, which was near Rimini, and uh, the forwards uh, squadron was being very heavily shelled and they asked us if I would give some supporting fire. So I was on my own, I parked my little armoured car at the top of the hill and walked down to the farmhouse. I met a rather tubby artillery officer also with the same task. And just as we arrived at the farmhouse we, feel, we heard mortar bombs dropping. He got a direct hit, and I was lucky I was able to escape. But after the war, I was in a little town in Austria, and my sergeants came up to me and said, there's a chap in the village who has recognized you. So I arranged to see him, and he described exactly what I have just described. And he was the man who brought the mortar on fire. So what do you do with him? We brought him a beer. <laughs> when they were going to casino, yeah. there's that many books you read that there's no Germans in casino. Well, more or less every morning at seven o'clock, oh, seven o'clock after seven, seven thirty, you could see the stretcher bearers coming down from the monastery, going towards the station in casino, and they were doing that every day. And whether it's true or not, I can't tell you. So I mean, the retinue stopped them at one time, and they've got ammunition in the stretchers. Whether that was true or not, I don't know. But that was uh, what was going down. But we used to see them stretchy bears coming down, <coughs> and I think there was a person in the Italy Star, who was in the, been in the magazine, that he was uh, OP office, officer for the tanks, and he was he was one of the first up in casino, 
and you see all the dead Germans in the monastery, so I don't know. <laughs> you, really say, you get these books read that there's nobody, no Germans in. Well, I, I spent ten days myself in casino itself in a cellar back that day. Not just myself, but we were in cellars like that there. And uh, if you're not doing a week, you've got to do a week, but if you had to go anywhere else, it were in the corner. And you could see, well, uh, the Germans in there. There's ones that would tank about, uh, what, 200 yards in front of us. And Lord Lascelles, the other of the Queen's cousin, he was trying to get a stunk on him, but he couldn't, because he was in that. He couldn't get a stunk on him, not there. And then uh, in Casino there, uh, we heard the voice, we got on the 18th set, we heard the voice saying, Oh, we've got to brew. And I can always remember saying, We're well, jammy, we well, just like that, you know. I mean, not knowing. I thought it meant a cup of tea, having a cup of tea. But it wasn't, it was when one of the tanks had got knocked out. We heard him say, Oh, we've got another brew. Anyway, that was that. And then we, they fetched us out. We had to go round the back, and it was the Canadians, and they're what in the size of a cricket pitch, like that. About there was about what eight or nine Sherman tanks. It it's very really strange down. because we got on a troop ship at Liverpool. I was part of a draft of about a hundred young officers going to it. We didn't know where we were going. We had no idea where we were going. We sailed and sailed and sailed. We had no idea where we were. We were in a convoy and uh, eventually we saw Gibraltar. So we had an idea we were in the Mediterranean but we still had no idea where we were going. Then one morning we woke up, we were sailing into Naples Bay with Vesuvius there and it, Naples Bay is beautiful and uh, we realised then where we were being taken but up to then you had no idea. Could have been the Far East through the canal but it wasn't. There was a very good spirit in Italy overall, I think, amongst <coughs> In a way, it must have been, I don't know what it was like in Northwest Europe after the invasion. Yeah, but, uh, to to yeah. but those traps, there was a possibility if they got a wound, they'd be back in England. There was no chance that we would get any leave or any evacuation to England, you were there, and you made the most of it. And I think that's my experience of the Italian campaign, that you were very much cut off. Uh, I mean, you, you do hear of stories where people had a bit of leave from Europe and across the channel and home. Nothing like that in Italy. There were some good arrangements made for us, I must say. We had an excellent newspaper every day, which kept us abused. The two types, you remember the two types? John. Yeah. John was there. Two, the two types were a cartoon. And of course, <clears throat> the rumor went out that Lady Astor had called us the D-Day Dodgers. Mm -hmm. And the two types cartoon a few days later had these two officers talking to each other and one is saying to the other, which day day does she mean old boy? <laughs> uh, because the people in Italy had been through several D days. How does it feel to you to have been a D day dodger? Well, we put it to music, of course. No feeling at all. None at all. I mean, we were just so amused that we put it to music. We are the D Day Dogs. I think that exemplifies everything in the wording of the verses, how we felt. Yeah.
Dear Lady Astor, think you know a lot Standing on your platform, talking Tommy Rot You England sweetheart and a bride We think your mouth too bloody white That's from the D-Day Dodgers Way out in Italy Look around the mountains in the mud and rain See the scattered crosses, some which have no name Heartbreak and toil, suffering gone The boys beneath them